whenever I'm teaching medication, if you haven't heard, I'm telling you, this is for farm and this both, you need to know your actions. If you do not know your actions, you do not know your medications. And I don't mean you know, like if it's blood pressure, it lowers your blood pressure. I mean, how does it work in the body? And that's what we're going to talk about today with these psych meds. Psych meds work on neurotransmitters. I know y'all had anatomy, physiology, and brain, right? You probably need to go back and review it, okay? Especially the physiology part. If you know your actions of your drug, you can tell me what they're used for, and you can tell me what side effects you need to watch out for. If not, you're just memorizing a bunch of stuff that next week you won't remember. That's why I want you to know your actions, okay? Let's see. We did still the best Back to that thing. It's All right, guys. I'll be passing around the roll every week, too. Do not sign anybody else's name, only your name. If I can't read your signature, I can't mark you present. So make sure I read it, please, okay? Okay, quick review. There you go. Okay, we're going to start at neurotransmitters. The other you should know, if you don't remember it, just go back and look it over, okay? Neurotransmitters are our main concern when we talk about all of the brain stuff because these are how our psychoactive medications work, okay? They play a role in the symptoms that you're going to see. If you know what dopamine does, you're going to know what happens if you have too much dopamine. You're going to know what happens if you don't have enough dopamine. You're going to know what the side effects of dopamine are. That's an example. Um, neurotransmitters, where are they released? Okay, presynapse. What happens to them? They bind. They can bind to receptors at the postsynapse. What else can happen to them? Okay, they can be blocked at the presynapse, at the postsynapse. Different medications work different ways. Um, they can be broken down. What are they broken down by? One of the things. What about your MAO inhibitors? Monamine oxidase ends in ASC, so we know it's an enzyme, right? It breaks down. What if it's not working? What if we have too much MAO oxidase? Okay, depending on what chemical it's working on. Okay, so it, and it also can be reabsorbed back at that presynapse too. So it can be absorbed at the presynapse, postsynapse, it can be broken down. Mainly what we're going to talk about is monamine oxidase, okay? So when you see monamine oxidase inhibitor, what's that telling you? It's, inhib it's, blocking it's inhibiting off. the breakdown, so what's going to happen to that chemical? It's going to build up. It's going to build up at the synapse, and that's where it's active at, okay? So that's how one of them works. Okay, and it, uh, they also relay your messages, okay? We have drugs that can decrease the reuptake at the presynapse, decrease the uptake at the postsynapse. SSRI, what is that? Serotonin. So what does that tell you it's working on? It's re- it's inhibiting the reuptake. So what happens at the synapse? It's building up. Okay. And serotonin, if we know what serotonin does, we know the effect that we're going to get when that happens. Serotonin is a drug that makes you happy, kind of calms you down a little bit. So that's one of our antidepressants. So that's one of the ways they work. We have drugs that can decrease the metabolism, our MOO inhibitors. They're not being metabolized by that enzyme, so they break up. I mean, the level goes up. We have drugs that it can increase the relapse, the release at the presynapse. We got more coming out. So what happens to that level at the synapse? Goes up. Goes up. 
okay? And then we have a special class of drugs that just stabilize, okay? They stabilize those chemicals. So that's some of the different ways that they can work. Everybody clear on all that? All right. Okay, now that's not confusing <coughs> enough. We have drugs that are excitatory and drugs that are inhibitory. Our excitatory chemicals are dopamine. Dopamine is responsible for complex movement, for your motivation to get out of bed and go to work, for cognition. What is cognition? Being able to think. Being able to think, higher thinking, okay? And also it helps regulate the emotions, your emotions. People with schizophrenia have too much dopamine. So what are you gonna see? If you know what dopamine does, what are you gonna see with schizophrenia? Complex movements, they have acastasia where they can't be still, they can't move, 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 move all the time. Cognition, they can't overthink. think clearly. Okay, so you can kind of start seeing their emotion. They're gonna be labile. Y'all know what labile means? Just kind of all over the place, up, down. That's what labile means. Also, norepinephrine is an excitatory. That helps you pay attention, helps you learn things, regulates your sleep cycle, wakefulness. Another one is epinephrine. That's the one that's responsible for your fight or flight. And it also does a lot of things to your vital signs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see some of those side effects if we start messing with it. Glutamate, that's another one. Glutamate is involved with memory, perception. It can be toxic at high levels. It's a precursor to GABA, which is an inhibitory. GABA helps calm you down. This is the very, this is, you don't hear about this one as much, but it's the most common. It's, it's present in like over 50% of the nervous tissue in the body. It's also associated with schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, all, autism. Those are all linked to abnormalities in glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Okay, our inhibitories are serotonin. Serotonin calms you down. SSRI is probably one of the most prescribed medications in the universe today. And if you look at all the actions, you'll see why they use it for so many different things. It can affect your food intake. That's why some people that get put on an SSRI gain weight. Sleep, wakefulness, temperature regulation, pain control, sexual function, regulation of emotion. Where do you, uh-huh. Can you change the slide, please? You don't have it? Okay, I'm bad about doing that, so just go like that and I'll do it. Okay, who can tell me where most of your serotonin is found? And it's probably not where you think. Nobody knows? Your GI tract. Huh. Your GI tract. So if you look at your side effect profile for your serotonin reuptake inhibitors, decreased libido. That's why a lot of people won't take it. <coughs> Interferes with their sex life. Appetite. It can also cause nausea. If you have all that serotonin in the GI tract, especially the duodenum. Emotional regulation, sleep can cause diarrhea. It's a huge side effect you never hear about with your SSRIs. Okay, another inhibitory is GABA. GABA kind of doesn't really do a lot on its own, but it kind of regulates a lot of the other ones, okay? Remember I told you it's precursor with glutamate, which is excitatory. Now we have some that can be excitatory or inhibitory. Acetylcholine is one sleep, wakefulness, and then histamine. Histamine helps regulate other neurotransmitters. 
One action of histamine, you may not know this, is to control your appetite. <coughs> so if you take histamines year-round and gain weight, that may be. Who's ever worked in a nursing home? Did y'all ever give peer reaction to stimulate appetite? Yeah, they're using it for a side effect of the medication, yeah. Histamines can make you eat more. Okay. Everybody up to date so far? Okay, I'm gonna remember. This just is a schematic. I'm not gonna test you on that. Just kind of a little additional information. Okay, so our receptors for our neurotransmitters, some of them are agonists. Agonists boost it, antagonists block it. And some of them are partial agonists, partial antagonists. So if that's not confusing enough. Okay. okay, some of the causes of mental illness. Genetics, huge, huge, huge. You look at studies of people that have bipolar in their family or schizophrenia in their family. You can see it running down through there. It's not the only thing though, but they do a lot of studies like on twins that were separated at birth and brought up in different environments to see if one of them has schizophrenia, what's the chance of another one having schizophrenia. But genetics is definitely a big thing. Um, compromised immune system can be another reason. Can predispose you. And then you have the right combination of stressors, okay? And when you talk about people, you, you see people that are raised in the same family, the same environment. Some of them do really well, some of them don't really do well. So, y'all ever heard of the nature versus nurture? Which one it is? Genetics definitely in mental health, okay? So be careful who you marry and trust you <laughs> with. Infections, especially viruses during the prenatal period, they've associated that and has a role in it. So we don't really know 100%, but we do know things that can put people at higher risk. Now, somebody comes in and they're acutely hallucinating, having delusions, seeing things, hearing things that aren't there, because there's like seven or eight different types of hallucinations. We have to rule out some things first, okay? And these are just some of the tests that we use to rule those things out, okay? Acute onset, new onset, we rule out other things. Could be a brain tumor, could be a virus, could be other things, could be dehydration. Especially older people come in hallucinating in the emergency room. What's the number one cause? UTI. UTI, yeah, okay. Delirium, all right. So these are just some of the tests we use for that. And when you're doing your care plans and you see people brought in Brentwood or LSU or whatever, you need to go back and look at those things, see if they ruled out some other things. Okay, psychopharmacology. These are some of the definitions you need to understand to understand these drugs. Psychotropic drugs, that's just a catch-all for all of these different drugs. It includes antipsychotics, first generation, second generation, third generation, antidepressants, SSRIs, CCAs, SNRIs, all of those are types of antidepressants. Mood stabilizers, such as lithium, which is a really old, old drug, but it's still used a lot today. Anxiolytics, you have your benzos and your non-benzos. And then we're gonna look at stimulants too. So psychotropic drugs, when I say that, I could be talking about any of those drugs, right? All right, efficacy. That is the maximum therapeutic effect that you can get, no matter how high you go up on that dose. Now, when you start learning some of the side effects of some of these drugs, they're fatal side effects that you'll see. So we need to really pay attention to that. We wanna use the lowest dose that we can because when you get up in those higher doses, you start getting those fatal side effects, okay? So that's efficacy. Potency is the amount of the drug that's needed for that effect. Some of the things that can affect that is somebody's weight, their protein binding, the function of what? Liver, liver. liver kidneys, depending on how it's <coughs> excreted. Okay, most of them it's liver, but with lithium it's kidneys because it's a salt-based drug. 
um, their metabolic rate, their thyroid function, all those things can affect that. So that's why we need to look at all those different lab tests to see what's going on with them. Okay, half-life. Who can tell me what a half-life is? Come on. The amount of time that it takes for half of the doses of medication to leave your body. There you go. Pretty much into the title of it, right? Half-life. Okay. All right, and that's all affected by these things I just told you, too. So you have somebody that's um, in stage renal disease, you may see them using half the dose. Or they may, it may be dialyzed out because they give it after dialysis one time because it never leaves the body because it's not being excreted, okay? So all those things we need to look at. Approved use is what is the indicated use. Now your SSRIs, the indicated use, they're an antidepressant, so it would be depression, right? But how many things do you see them used for? A million different things. Neuropathic pain. What else? Insomnia, anuresis, anxiety, okay? But the approved use is what it's indicated for. Off-label use, what you see a lot of drugs used for off-label. That means it's not um, approved, but it's not forbidden. Black box warning, high risk warning. When you look up a drug, that should be the first thing that you look at. Because when you get out of here and you get out of farm, you're gonna know, if you know your classes, you're gonna know what that drug does. So you don't even need to look that up. <coughs> but you do need to look up, see if there's a black box. Black box means this is high risk, this is a red flag. You have got to look out for it. And with these drugs, there's a lot of black box warning, okay? You also need to teach your patient about it, okay? Neuromalignant syndrome, that's something you see with antipsychotics where their blood pressure shoots up, they start CPK levels go up, they can go into renal failure. What, so you need to warn your patient about that. Your, if your fever goes up, if your muscles start hurting, you need to immediately do this, okay? So that's one of the things that I look for too. So that's your red flag. Some of these side effects also are debilitating and they're irreversible, okay? Your tardive dyskinesia. You ever seen anybody in, I like to pick up Walmart. You ever seen anybody in Walmart doing this? Things like that? That's called tardive dyskinesia, it's from these drugs. Somebody kept giving it. So now it's irreversible, they gotta live with that the rest of their life, okay? So that's important for you to know. I've seen people that were kept giving Haldol and giving them Haldol, giving them Haldol to where the point that they're in a wheelchair like this, can't move for the rest of their life because some dumb nurse kept giving Haldol, didn't know what they were doing, okay? So you gotta know these. This is really, really, really important to know. Okay. Um, also, some of the principles. We want to look at the optimal effect on the target symptom. If we're giving it for hallucinations, are we giving it for delusions? Are we giving it for panic attacks? For depression? For the negative signs and symptoms of schizophrenia? Positive signs and symptoms of schizophrenia? Adequate dose for a sufficient time? Some of these drugs take two to three weeks to get the level up before you start seeing those hallucinations start to decrease or the delusions start to decrease. So that's something you would need to tell your patient because if not, they're gonna say, I'm still having this problem. Why should I take this med? It's gonna take two to three weeks to get your level where it needs to be, okay? Lowest effective dose because we wanna limit those side effects that I've been kind of alluding to. Lower doses for older people. You ever heard with geriatrics, the golden rule, start low, go slow when you're adjusting meds, okay? Because of all those reasons, their kidneys aren't working as well, their liver's not working as well, they don't have as much muscle mass, so there's less protein bonding, all of those different reasons. Their metabolism slowed down. Also, some of these drugs have to be tapered off. You can't just stop them cold turkey. Rebound symptoms, what does that mean? Well, that's when you stop taking it, and it can give you some symptoms. It comes back worse. Rebound is where those original ones come back. 
withdrawal, you can have a whole new set of signs and symptoms, okay? Say, for instance, somebody was on the benzo Ativan for three years and somebody decided to take them off of it, stopped it cold turkey. Now their panic attacks are back, but now they're also having seizures, okay? They didn't have those before, but now they are. So you have to be real careful with a lot of these psych meds for that reason. Um, my daughter is an attorney for the Bossier Parish um, Sheriff's Department. She had this case she was asking me about. This young guy that was put in jail up there, and he had been on Xanax for years and years and years, not prescribed, but he had still been on them, so he's still gonna have this. Doesn't matter if it was legal or not. The family kept calling and saying, he's been on Xanax, y'all need to be careful. He's been on Xanax, you need to be careful. Well, sure enough, three or four days into his jail, fell and hit his head, had a subdural hematoma and died. So that's a good case. That's a good example of that. You have to taper these drugs down. He never had seizures before, but now he had one, had a head injury and killed himself. Okay. Um, follow-up care, we have to have follow-up care because we have to look at compliance. The number one reason psych patients are readmitted to the psych unit over and over and over and over and over is non-compliance of medications. And th that can be for a lot of different reasons. You have to find out why they quit taking it. Did they not have the money? They didn't have a way to the drugstore? Did their prescription run out? Did they not like the side effects? Okay. So what is it? Why did they quit taking it? And then we can address it. Also, you need a simple regimen. These people's cognition is not well. They may be hallucinating, having delusions. They're paranoid. They think you're trying to kill them because you're giving them this med. So how well do you think they're going to be compliant on that med? Probably not at all, okay? So we do have different forms that we can give it in. We can give what's called depot ejections of some of these antipsychotics that can last anywhere from a week to a month, okay? And that can be court ordered if, if, if they have a legal proceeding or a problem. It can be a condition of their discharge. If you don't come back in every month at this time and get this, we're gonna arrest you and put you back in jail and probably end up back in the psych unit because there's a lot of people that are um, in the legal system. I would say probably half of them have psych problems or some type of personality disorder. Okay, so those depot injections are like deep IM, they release gradually over a month. And that helps with compliance tremendously, as you can see, right? They don't have a choice. Okay, so our antipsychotic drugs. Antipsychotic drugs block your dopamine receptors, D1 through D5, D2 through D5 are the ones that are associated with mental illness. Now go back and think about all the things dopamine does, okay? The oldest ones, before the 50s, when you go back and read chapter one, which I hope that you do because it's kind of going to help you give you a context to understand how mental health nursing came about. Before the 50s, you were put in a psych unit and probably pretty much stayed there forever because there wasn't a whole lot they could do. There weren't any meds or anything. Well, in the 50s, they came up with what's called antipsychotic meds that work on these dopamine receptors. So at that time, they decided we're going to deinstitutionalize people. That's we're going to put them back into society. Because now we have these meds to control these really, what I call, what they're called the positive side, the positive signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. That's the ones you can really see, like delusions, hallucinations, the strange behaviors, the all the other things that when you think of a psych patient, you think of. Okay. So in the 50s, these came out. These were called typicals or conventionals or first-generation antipsychotics. You may see them referred to as any of those names. These were the first ones that came out. Thorazine, Haldol, and there were some others too. But these are our typicals. These block D2 through D4 receptors. 
So we're blocking that dopamine. They got too much dopamine going on. Now when you block D2 receptor, that's where you get your extra pyramidal side effects. They're, they're called EPSs. These include the dystonias. And if you've had med term, you know what dys means and tonia means. These are your muscle spasms. Sometimes there's all different ones. There's torticollis where their neck pulls around. There's oligeric crises where their eyes roll back in their head. So there's all different there, but they're associated and they're painful spasms. These can be irreversible. Also your achastasia, that's where they can't be still. If you're talking to them in the side, you know, they're doing this, doing this, and then they'll just jump up and go down the hall, come back and sit down, and they just cannot be still. That's a symptom of schizophrenia. It's also a side effect of this med. So that's why you have to have a good intake assessment. Did this start after the med or did they already have this? Okay. Pseudo Parkinson's. Y'all know what somebody with Parkinson's looks like? They have the mask-like face, the drooling, what's called the ratcheted arm movements. Their arms don't swing like this, they're like this. Last semester I did that and hurt my knee, so I'm not gonna do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and have injections in my knee. But they walk kind of like this. Okay, that's that ratchet. They're not, they don't have that normal movement to their it's arm. Mass like, huh? It's not fluid. Yeah, exactly. Right. And they have when they first get up to move, they have a hard time getting up to move and then they get to going. Okay, you'll see that with some of these meds. It's called pseudo Parkinson's because they don't have Parkinson's, but they have all the symptoms of it, okay? So, that's a side effect. Tardive dyskinesia. Tardive means chewing. So you use grinding movements, protruding tongue. So can you kind of see why maybe they don't want to take some of these meds? Yeah. Okay, you get that when you block the D2 receptor. Okay, so later they came out, a few years later, with what they call a typical second generation, non-conventional, so it's all the same thing. These only weakly block D2. So you get less of the EPS side effect. Now at the higher doses, you'll still get them, but at your normal doses, not so much. These are Clozarel, Risperidol, Zyprexa, and I've got your generic names on here. When I test you, I'll give you both, but when you go to state board, you're gonna have generic names, okay? You're not gonna have brand names. So these walk weekly block S D2. And then we have what's called third generation, or new generation. This is a Piperzole or a Bilify. These stabilize dopamine. So they're not making it less more, they just stabilize it, there's its amount. Instead of blocking those receptors, they're stabilizing the output. So those are our antipsychotics. So it affects how much is put into, how much is released? Well, if it's, the way that I understand it is, you know, with schizophrenia, they're putting out too much, mm -hmm. so it just that stabilizes the output. Okay. 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 Yeah, Abilify is the main one in there. Okay, so these antipsychotics are used for psychotic symptoms. When we talk about schizophrenia, they have what's called positive side effects, negative side effects. The way that I remember it, positive is a plus sign, right? That's something extra you should, you're seeing you shouldn't see. Hallucinations. Hallucinations can be visual, auditory, gustatory, tactile, synesthetic, proprioceptive, where they feel like they're separated from their body. They feel like they can feel their bones making red blood cells. The most common type, auditory. That's your most common type. People hearing things that nobody else hears. Those are a positive, a type of positive. Delusions is another one. A delusion is a fixed 
false belief. I believe that I'm the king of the universe and you are all my peasants. Okay, you would not believe some of the delusions that I had heard during the years. So they don't necessarily see that. That's the delusions, but that's just what they think. Right. Okay. And they believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I had one tell me one time that he was King David. All the women in the world were for him. The sun rose in his navel, and I'm not going to tell you where it's at. But, <laughs> and he truly believed that. Yeah. Or they believe that they have a cattle ranch in Montana. Or they believe that the FBI is out to get them. Mm -hmm. Or they believe just anything. It can be anything. But they truly believe that. Okay. And it's fixed and it doesn't go away. That's a delusion. Oh. Racing thoughts, those are all positive symptoms. Negative symptoms would be the things that make them odd, that they don't fit into society. Elogia, anhedonia, apathy, disorganized thinking. They can't concentrate, so they can't hold a job. They can't remember when to take their meds. They don't remember to pay their light bill, so they don't have any light. They just can't think. So how do you think that's going to affect compliance with meds? Now you take this AC and PC and HS on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then you take this, no. Give them an injection once a month, they may be able to handle that, because they're not gonna remember all that other stuff. Um, disorganized thinking, no social functioning at all. So negative side effects have to do with, Think I'm, a, I'm a little confused. Positive are things that are there that shouldn't be there. Negative are things that should be there that aren't there. Okay. Right, That's how I remember it. As far as boundaries, social, they don't understand that at all. Boundaries, there are no boundaries. So They'll come the sit in your lap makes, and see nothing wrong with it. Huh? So they normally have like the cognition to do all that stuff. They take the medicine and it wipes it out. So it's a negative. No, these are signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. Oh, schizophrenia. Yeah, positive and negative Not signs. Not the medication. Yeah. Oh. I thought yeah. it was of the medication. Yeah, me too. No, I'm sorry. These are signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay. And I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. Y'all got to remember when you come to do this. Okay. So your negative or your odd behaviors are positive or things, okay? Now, the reason I'm telling you this before we get to schizophrenia is because your conventionals are your first generations or your typicals, remember that's three different names, you may hear them referred to as work better on the positive symptoms, not so much on the negative. So they're not actively hallucinating, but they're still real weird acting. So they don't really fit back in. When they came out with the atypicals, second generations, they help with the positive and the negative. So they help them function better and fit back into society better, okay? Like a military. Yes, or no, like your clothes rail, your Sparadol, things like that. Yeah, typical, atypical, and then... Third generation. We can call that third generation. Yeah. I know, it's confusing, I know. Is that typical with positive? Yes, not so much on negative. As they made them better, now they're addressing positive and negative. Now, some people don't respond to the second generation or they can't take them because of the side effect profile. Clozarel is a second generation and the problem with it is it knocks out your white blood cell count. You get what's called agranulocytosis. So much, it's like 25% of the people have it. So if they put on that, it's a great med if it works though. I mean, it really, really helps. But you have to do a white blood cell count every two weeks for the first six months. If it drops below 3,500, you have to take them off of it. So it works great, but it's got a bad side effect. Okay. What's my bathroom break? <laughs> you need one? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Five minutes. <coughs> Three main ones, I'm sorry. And I remember at DPA, Dystonias, fetal Parkinson's, aphasia. Now, they usually occur the first few days or the first couple of weeks, or if they increase a dose, this is when you'll see them. 
torticollis is the twisted neck. Episcotonius is where they have tightness and their heads pull back like this. These are all types of dystonias. <coughs> Oligeric crisis is where their eyes will roll back in their head and just lock back there. Treatment is cogentin, which is an anticholinergic. So you're going to have to dry mouth, inability to voice, especially with older men, constipation, dry eyes. C O G E N T I N. Now, sometimes you'll see it ordered PRN, or some doctors just order it given along with the antipsychotic. Another one they can use is diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. And you can see these dystonias with other drugs too. Phenergan will cause it. Second one is your P, pseudo Parkinson. Talked about that. Also, use cogen for that. Acastasia, restlessness, anxiety, agitation. For that, you may see a beta blocker used, anticholinergic or a benzodiazepine. But there's a lot of teaching goes along with this, okay? Another side effect of your antipsychotics is NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. <coughs> 10 to 20% of the time it is fatal, it'll kill them. This usually occurs the first few weeks. Uh -huh. no, uh, or with an increased uh, dose. That's why I give you all these PowerPoints so you have them. <laughs> if you will remember autonomic nervous system instability, that tells you the signs and symptoms of NMS. What happens is their temp shoots up, Blood pressure becomes unstable, can be high or low. They get what's called lead pipe rigidity, where you cannot bend their joints. This is very similar to serotonin syndrome, except the blood pressure is up or down. With serotonin, it bottoms out, and you don't get lead pipe rigidity with your serotonin syndrome. Are they, is this reversible? It can be, but 10 to 20% of the time, it's fatal. CPK shoots up, CPK gets high enough, you know it can damage the kidneys. Confusion, to, all the way from confusion to super to coma. You treat it symptomatically. If their temp's up, you put them on a cooling blanket. Treat their blood pressure. It's hard to treat though, because sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. You treat the high, and then you get the low, and then you're constantly trying to stabilize that blood pressure. So it just loses all Autonomic, autonomic control. Yeah. Are they Can be. The blood pressure drops. Yeah. You know, blood pressure drops, heart rate goes up, yeah. opposite happens. Yeah. So NMS is bad. That's why we want to get the lowest dose we can. Because with your higher doses, you get these side effects worse. Tardive dyskinesia can be irreversible. Why you see so many people going around with all these grinding movements? This occurs up to 30% of the time. Higher the dose, the higher the risk of it. Can be permanent, can be irreversible. Treatment for this is decrease or DC that med. This can occur after being on a med for years. Just all of a sudden it pops up. A lot of the time it is irreversible. And then you get your anticholinergic side effects from your antipsychotic, dry mouth, constipation, urinary hesitancy, retention, can't see, can't see, can't spit, can't mm -hmm. This is higher with elderly people. Treat it symptomatically. Fiber, water, exercise, decrease the dose. You couldn't give them cholinergic drugs? You could. This usually occurs the first few days. 
and can last throughout the treatment. If it's bad enough, they may have to DC the med. If it's livable and we can cope with it, you know, they may leave them on it. <coughs> okay, other side effects, prolactin level can go up. You can have gynecomastia in males, breast enlargement, weight gain, especially with your se second generation. Geodon doesn't seem to do it as bad. Prolonged QT interval, that's on your EKG. So if somebody has a history of a cabbage or DMI, they may not want to put them on some of these meds. They're really high risk and that gives them a double risk. Agranulocytosis, I told you about that with clozapine or clozarel. So if they're on that med, you need to tell them if you start developing a sore throat, fever, you need to immediately go to the emergency room, talk to your doctor. Because teaching, 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 teaching with these. Okay, client teaching. What do they miss a dose? What lab do they need to monitor? What symptoms do they need to watch for? What to do if it occurs? You never teach somebody to watch for something if you're not gonna tell them what to do if it occurs. Do they call their doctor? Do they tell them at the next visit? Do they immediately go to the emergency room? Some of these are emergency room visits, okay? Okay, antidepressants. Major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder. We use them with bipolar for the depressed phase of bipolar. Psychotic depression. People can get so depressed they can become psychotic and start hallucinating, okay? Bipolar. Bipolar is where you have the real high moods, the real low moods, and there are several different types. There's bipolar one, two, okay? But in a nutshell, that's what it is. So we use it for the depressive side of it. Now, you have to be careful with that because if you use SSRIs for depressive side of uh, bipolar, you can cause what's called rapid cycling where they cycle two or three times in one day. High low, high low, high low, instead of several weeks of this and several weeks of that. Okay. Other uses, that would be our off-label uses, right? Bulimia, anuresis, OCD, post-traumatic stress, weight loss, smoking cessation, chronic pain, neuropathy. You see them used for all different kind of things, okay? There's four major groups, our tricyclics, our SSRIs, which are our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, means they selectively work on serotonin, our SNRIs, which work on serotonin and norepinephrine, and our MAO inhibitors, like the enzyme that breaks down those neurochemicals, right? Okay, they work, all of them pretty much work on the monamine neurotransmitter system, okay? That being said, it's gonna affect norepinephrine, serotonin. Some of them more serotonin, some of them more norepinephrine, okay? And the reason that sometimes they'll mix and put an SNRI is with your SSRIs. Sometimes they just make people feel like this just monotone, okay? There's not any highs, not any lows. And with the when you put that little pop of norepinephrine in there, it kind of gives them a little more energy, makes them feel a little bit better. Some people can't tolerate it because it's norepinephrine, it causes tachycardia, blood pressure, problems with that, okay? But that's the difference in the two. We use these for people that are on high risk for suicide. They have a black box warning, you'll notice. That's that high risk warning, increased suicidality especially with adolescents. Adolescents are very impulsive, they don't think things through. So that's why they're really at a high risk. Yeah. And some of the studies I've read said they really don't make you more suicidal. What they do is they get you out of that deep dark hole where you have the energy to think about killing yourself so that you can make a plan and get through with it. You got the energy to do it now. So two weeks after being on, it's when they're at the highest risk. So you really gotta watch it. Right. 
before then they don't have the energy or they can't even think well enough to do it. Okay, so our SSRIs block serotonin only and make it more available at those synapses. Side effects can be anxiety, agitation, achesthesia, nausea, vomiting, because remember I told you serotonin's found in the GI system, so we start messing with that. Weight gain. Takes several weeks to get the level up. Diarrhea is a big side effect. You don't hear that much about it, I don't know why, but a lot of your serotonin's in the <coughs> GI tract. So some people can't tolerate it for that reason. Okay, your TCAs. TCA stands for tricyclic. That means it has three actions. It blocks serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine at the presynaptic nerve. So it's blocking it from being excreted or released or however you want to say it. I'm sorry, I told y'all that wrong. Take that back. Because I'm sitting here thinking, well, if it did that, that wouldn't work. It blocks the reuptake at the presynapse. Remember I told you it can be taken back up here, taken back up here, broken down here. These are reuptake and it blocks that reuptake so it's higher at the synapse. They have anticholinergic side effects, also orthostatic hypertension, sedation, weight gain. TCAs. Uh -huh. TCAs have anticholinergic <coughs> side effects. That's why they're usually given at night because they make you sleepy. You'll see them used a lot, especially by older doctors for chronic pain. Can cause tachycardia, sexual dysfunction. Again, they take several weeks to take effect. Tricyclics, three chemicals they work on, okay? Serotonin works on one, your SSRIs. Okay, your MAOIs, these are the ones that block that enzyme. So it's not broken down, so it's higher at that synapse where it's active. Blocks monamine oxidase. <coughs> monamine oxidase can break down dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. Now, the problem with these is you can develop a hypertensive crisis if you eat foods that have tyramine in them with this drug. Tyramine is a vasopressor amine that raises the blood pressure. It's in these foods. So we don't have that the monamine oxidase to break that tyramine down now, and it's a presser so it's gonna shoot the blood pressure up, okay? These are aged foods. Anything that's aged, beer is aged, pepperonis aged, sauerkraut's aged, pepperonis, cheeses are aged. Your soft cheeses aren't aged. I don't know if y'all know that. Did y'all have any nutrition classes? As cheeses age, they get hard, okay? So your soft ones like um, mozzarella, the buffalo mozzarella, cottage cheese and all that, it's not going to work. It's not going to hurt those, but your aged hard cheeses like cheddar and um, yeah, your hard ones. So any food that's aged has tyramine. They cannot eat it with this drug. What about whiskey? Whiskey's aged. Oh. Just tell them you don't want to be on an MOI. You want to be on something else. <laughs> So there, there's your teaching, okay? Severe hypertensive crisis. So they need to know, you start getting a headache, getting dizzy, blah, 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 and you're on this med, you better go to the ER because we're going to have to put you on something to lower your blood pressure so you don't stroke out. Now, these aren't used near as much as they used to be because now we have the newer classes, the SSRIs and all, okay? But you will sometimes see it. I need to tell you about that. Okay. Um, some of your other things can cause some of the some of your antidepressants, not antihypertensive, uh, sedation, headache, loss of appetite, nausea, because of where the serotonin's at. It's all through the GI tract, okay? Also priapism. Not a real common one, but it can occur. That's a prolonged erection without sexual stimulation. Okay. So they need to know if that happens, what they need to do. Another um, antidepressant, 
uh, thing that it can cause is called serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome can occur anytime if you have an MAOI, do not give it with anything. That's just the rule of thumb, okay? Because it's gonna react with everything. To the point to where if you're on an MAI, you have to have a two week washout period to get it out of your system before you can be put on any other meds, okay? Now serotonin syndrome can occur if you use an SSRI and an MAOI together. Serotonin syndrome, you have an increased temp, blood pressure bottoms out. Blood pressure bottoms out, what's gonna happen to the heart rate? Go up. Okay, so you're gonna have tachycardia. Tremors, diaphoresis, dilated pupils. You don't get the lead pipe rigidity, okay? That's with NMS. If you use more than one serotonergic drug together, you can get serotonin crisis. Imitrex is a serotonergic drug. Take it with an SSRI, this can occur, okay? So you need to know what your serotonergic drugs are. Those are drugs that affect serotonin, okay? Oh, let's see. With serotonin syndrome, you get what's called ANS activation. The other one is ANS instability. So they're really similar, okay? Agitation, sweating, fever, tachycardia, unstable hypotension. So, I mean, it can be 91 minute, 40 the next. Real unstable. Rigidity, hyperreflexia. That means, you know, when y'all learned um, physical assessment, your normal reflexes are plus three, they're plus six with this, okay? So instead of just getting this in your leg, it might kick you across the room, okay? Or your brachial, I mean, be like this instead of just this twitch that you're looking for when you do the brachial. Okay, so you're gonna have lower extremity rigidity, hyperreflex, bottomed out blood pressure, okay? That is serotonin syndrome. Teaching, we're gonna look at the time of the dose, if they miss it, what they need to do. SSRIs are usually taken in your SNRIs first thing in the morning. You take them at night, they're gonna keep you awake. Your TCAs, your tricyclics, Elevil, given at night. It's a, gonna have anticholinergic side effects, so you may wanna have them void before they take that med. They may have to increase fiber, increase exercise, increase fluids, dry mouth sugar-free candy, whatever. We're working on those side effects. Older males, you really want them voiding before. Okay, um, if they miss their SSRI, they take it for like up to eight hours afterwards. TCAs, two to three hours. After that, it's gonna make them sleepy the next day. Also need to teach them about dietary restrictions. What are age foods? Okay, mood stabilizers, lithium is used. And we also use anticonvulsants for that, certain anticonvulsants. Valproic acid, copramate, which is copamax, used to stabilize those moods in bipolar. And I know you haven't learned about bipolar, but just think of highs and lows, okay? Then you'll learn more about it later. <coughs> Okay, the way that lithium works, lithium is a salt. It's a salt-based drug. It increases, it normalizes certain transmitters, increases the levels of GABA, and GABA is the mood stabilizer. It also, lithium works for what's called the kindling process that you get with bipolar. Think about a snowball rolling down a hill. You're getting manic, 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 manic. That's called a kindling process. It helps stop that, okay? It is a salt-based drug. That is important because if the body becomes dehydrated, it sees lithium as a salt. And what's the body do to salt when you're dehydrated? Hold it holds on to it because it fluid follows it, right? So it's going to hold on to that lithium and you're going to get toxic on lithium, okay? So not only are you dehydrated and you're hemoconcentrated now, but your body's holding on to that lithium 
but that sees it as a salt. Depending on the level of toxicity is what symptoms you're gonna see. Nausea, diarrhea, anorexia, fine hand tremor. <coughs> They're gonna become very thirsty. Metallic taste, acne, that's long-term side effects of lithium. Toxicity, they can have severe diarrhea, which is gonna make them even more hemoconcentrated. Vomiting, drowsiness, muscle weakness, loss of coordination. Lithium is also what we call a narrow therapeutic index. That means there's a real fine line between being therapeutic and toxic. Okay, so it's, you gotta keep it right at that level. Since it's salt-based, they need to drink two to three liters of fluid a day, and that's non-caffeinated, because caffeinated fluids dehydrate you, right? We, won't, we don't want them caffeinated. Narrow therapeutic index, 0 0.5 to 1.5 is therapeutic. Two point, you start getting into your toxicity. Three point, they have to go to dialysis. So it's really, really tight, okay? And then you get into somebody that's not thinking right, that's manic, okay? See, they have to be hydrated. Other class that's used for, um, that you may see it in use in the place of or in addition to as an adjunct to lithium are your anticonvulsants. Depakote or valproic acid, the one you see used a lot. Tecretol, carb carbamazepine is tecretol. Now, has anybody in here ever taken an anti or muscle relaxant? What's the big side effect? Drowsiness. Knock out, a drowsiness, yeah. They're kind of tamping everything down, right? Anticonvulsants are very sedating. Okay, Tromazepine is Tecretol, rash or static hypertension. Valproic acid is Depakote. Weight gain, alopecia, hand tremor, and then topramut or topamax, dizziness, sedation, weight loss. Lithium, we have to monitor those levels. Initially, we have to do it until we get it within therapeutic range. Once it's stabilized, they have to have that fluid and they have to have a stable salt intake. Because you can see how salt in the diet can affect the way your body's hanging on to it, getting rid of it, the fluid level. You may see a peak in a trough level drawn. Trough levels are <clears throat> when you wanna see what it is at the very lowest. That's usually 12 hours after the dose. Peak levels, it depends on the route. If it's IV, they're quicker. If it's PO, a little bit longer. Because your peak, you're wanting to see what the highest level they have is. Lithium is a drug that has to be given with food and cause severe nausea, even if it's just a glass of milk, that's okay. So safety measures are hydration, hydration, hydration. You're in the hot months, they may have to drink more than two, three liters. If they work out in the sun, they're a roofer, they may be drinking six liters. What if they're NPO for test? What if they have nausea, vomit, and diarrhea? All that has to be considered. Salt intake has to be stable. Two to three liters, non-caffeinated. Once that therapeutic dose is established, salt has to be stable. Okay, our anxiolytics. Anxiolytics or anti-anxiety drugs. Use them for anxiety, anxiety disorders, insomnia, OCD, which is an anxiety disorder. You may see them used with depression, post-traumatic stress. 
Alcohol withdrawal, circle that one, big time. We use them to prevent DTs, or delirium tremens. Because you think about it, somebody has alcohol, 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 alcohol for years and years and years. Alcohol's a depressant, right? We take it away all of a sudden. What's the body gonna do? It's gonna have the opposite effect of depression, right? They're gonna start doing this, doing this, tremoring, all the way to seizures. I've seen people have full grandma seizures coming off of alcohol. So we use the benzos to prevent that. They control GABA or benzodiazepines do. Benzodiazepines would be Ativan, Xanax, what's some of the other? Valium. Valium, Versed, those are your benzodiazepines. Those are the ones we use for alcohol withdrawal. Or sometimes other things too. Okay. Um, there's also a non-benzo anti-anxiety drug, Buspar. It works at, the way that it works, it's an agonist on those serotonin receptors. An agonist means it's agon on that serotonin, so it's making that serotonin more active, okay? Bus, Buspar? Buspar? Buspirin or Buspar? Oh, all right. B-U-S-P-I-R-O-N-E is the generic name. Oh. But Buspar is the trade name, yeah. That's the non-benzo. Those others are benzos. Okay, benzodiazepines can cause, here's some examples of them. Um, physical dependence, big time. Do I not have that written on? Okay. Physical and psychological dependence. This is one you can't withdraw cold turkey. It has to be tapered off. They call CNS depression. If you take them with alcohol, it increases the effect of alcohol by five times. So instead of having a shot of whiskey, you just have five shots of whiskey. Okay? So they can't be used together. They're not used with acute alcohol intoxication. They're used for withdrawal of alcohol, okay? Now, I know a lot of people that drink and take them, but if they quit drinking and quit taking that, they're probably gonna have seizures if they don't taper off of it, because both of those are tamping everything down. Um, they also cause amnesia. That's why they give them for certain procedures so you don't remember it. Like colonoscopes and EGDs and things, yeah. That's the problem. Some people have test anxiety and take it and then they study and guess what? They don't remember what they studied because it has an amnesic effect. You can develop a tolerance. That means you need more and more and more to get that same effect and a dependence, psychological and physical. They have to be tapered. Sure, I tell Okay, so safety measures with your benzos, falls, alcohol use with them, other sedative meds with them can potentiate them. Y'all know what potentiate means? Instead of two plus two, it's two times 10. Okay, it's not a one plus one effect. They multiply each other. Avoidance of alcohol, they must be tapered off. Amphetamines. Uses, they do have some medical uses mostly ADHD in children, which is an, um, attention, deficit. attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADD in adults, attention deficit disorder without the hyperactivity. They're also used for um, narcolepsy. People there just be talking to you and just go to sleep, go to sleep while they're driving, they use them for that. You'll see them used for weight loss because of the side effects of them. Action. The reason they have such a big bang reaction is they work in three different ways. <coughs> they cause the release of norepinephrine, dopamine. Both of those are excitatory, right? And some serotonin presynaptically. So we're putting out more from the presynapse. 
they add on that effect at the post amount, and then they block its reuptake. So it's just flooded with all those chemicals. That's why they're so strong. They have three different effects or actions. Side effects, anorexia. We use it for that action for weight loss, right? Nausea, irritability. It's a stimulant, so you get tachycardia, hypertension, dry mouth, growth and development suppression in pediatrics, and we use it a lot with ADHD. Okay, so there's some teaching we're gonna have to do there. For children, most of this client teaching has to do with children that we're giving at ADHD. We wanna give it after meals. I used to have a pediatric clinic as a nurse practitioner. Um, I gave tons of this in the morning, tons of it. They couldn't give it before they came to school because they ate breakfast at school, so I'd give them their medicine after breakfast. You need to avoid caffeine, sugar, chocolate, all those are stimulants. You have to keep it out of reach. One month supply can kill someone. Also, you have to keep it locked up because people steal it and sell it. They need drug holidays. That means we don't give it on Saturday and Sunday during the summer, maybe get them off of it. You have to watch their growth and development because they don't want to eat. You want to avoid caffeine, sugar, and chocolate because that's a those are, that, that, yeah. those those are body, right? yeah. Or trying to unstimulate. Right. So if we're giving something to calm them down, we don't want to give them a food that's going to hype them right back up. Nutrition, they need to have high calorie, nutrient dense foods, maybe finger foods, high abuse potential. You have to keep it locked up. Can be fatal. They get old, that doesn't take a month. Okay. So those are some teaching things that you do with it. Disulfiram. <laughs> Okay, so when, when, some, when somebody has ADHD, you give them a stimulant, it calms them down. If somebody doesn't have ADHD, you give them a stimulant, they're, they're going to go. Speed you up. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. You'll see it given more and more and more for adults now with just the ADD, the attention deficit where they can't concentrate. It helps them yeah. concentrate yeah, and be able to. Four, so, and, and still take it. So without it, there's not, this, this class course is not even an option. You know, but, uh, Did you I'm, need a double dose? No, no, but if, if I, you know, I can't sit and read for yeah. a couple of hours at a time I need to without reading a certain page 15 times. Yeah. So If someone needs it, it's a great drug. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, after those kids used to come, I'd have them lined up in the hall, take their meds, and I'd have to draw X's on the walls where I kept them separated because they'd be out there fighting and fighting. Oh, I'm going to jack you up and choking each other. This was on <laughs> By Tuesday morning, they were little angels. Even by Monday after lunch when I'd give their meds, they'd just sit there like this. But, man, when they were coming off the weekend, they were wild. Yeah, I can remember mine. If I, if I missed a dose, my teacher, as a matter of fact, I kept some in school at the office. And if I missed a dose and, you know, started acting crazy at school or whatever, and they, you take the soda off to get your medicine. But you have to use it with behavior modification, yeah. too. You can't just yeah. throw that pill at them. That's you right. know, you've got to do other things along with it. But it works great. Yeah. Okay, disulfiram is antabuse. Antabuse starts with an A. Think aversion, antabuse. It does not make them not want to drink. What it does is if they drink with it, they will think they're dying. Oh, God. Okay? So think AA, aversion, antabuse, AA, alcoholic anonymous. It's aversion, okay? It inhibits the enzyme that's involved with um, alcohol metabolism, and you will get a severe reaction if you take alcohol with it. It's called a disulfiram type reaction. You'll get it with other drugs too, like flagell and alcohol. You'll get a disulfiram type reaction. Flushing. Flushing means all the blood's going to the surface, right? So what's gonna happen to the blood pressure? Increase. 
Drop. It's going to bottom out. So what's going to happen to the heart rate? It's going to go up. Go up. What's going to happen inside the head? It's an enclosed space. It's going to increase headache. ICP. Okay, so they're tachycardic. The blood pressure's falling out. They're red. They've got a horrible headache. They're starting to get confused. And it can go to coma death. So you can have a bad, bad reaction. Okay? That's a disulfram type reaction. People that are on Quadril need to be warned too. Don't drink with this. You're going to be sick, 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 sick if you do. Okay? What if, say, somebody's on antabuse and they take some NyQuil? They didn't know it was 25% alcohol. That's why it makes you sleep so good. They're going to have a disulfram type reaction or with Quadril. Okay? So you got to warn them about it. Just normal side effects of it are halitosis, tremor, drowsiness, tiredness, impotence. This is a drug that can be court ordered. So, you're the nurse working, giving out antibodies. You better be watching for some chicken going on. Chickens where they hide it in their chicks, go out, spit it out. My little kids used to do that with their stimulants too. You gotta watch. You gotta look in the mouth with the tongue blade. They can flip it from side to side. So that's one thing you gotta watch with this. Because some of them don't wanna take it. It's court ordered for them to take it, okay? So that's disulfram. It can also react with a lot of different drugs. A lot of your other drugs. Um, Dilantin, TB drugs, Coumadin. So you need to teach them where do you find alcohol that you don't think it is okay they need to know different meds different cough meds nyquil what happens if it occurs what to watch for okay some of the cultural things i'm just going to mention real quick some of your different cultures have different reactions to some of these meds okay Asian people will get toxic on them faster and they have a slower metabolism of the drugs. Elderly people, you've got to watch really anybody, but especially elderly people, poly pharmacy. They have they'll come into the emergency room, the bag of meds this big. This doctor's giving them this and this and this and this, and it's all reacting with each other. So you gotta watch for that. Also because you know all the things we talked about why they don't metabolize as fast. So different cultures metabolize meds differently, okay? Just like your blood pressure meds. You know, African Americans don't do well on the frills and they do better on these and these other things as monotherapies. The same with these antipsychotics and your um, anxiolytics and all of those. So we're gonna use lower doses for Asians and African Americans of lithium. Lower doses of our antidepressants for Hispanics. Another thing, this is something that y'all need to remember because on ATI, students don't seem to know this. When you're taking a medication history, you have to look at all the meds, over-the-counter meds. A lot of these herbal medications have very active substances in them, and they will interact with these meds, especially your spike meds, okay? Some of them you really got to watch for is your St. John's wort, valerian. The ginkgo bilboa, or however you say that, <laughs> kava, all those react with these side meds. So always when you're taking your history or looking at meds, look at those things too. What else do you take that's not prescription? Because sometimes they just tell you they're prescription meds. Okay. barriers um, you know I told you the number one reason that they're they come back in and out of the hospital is non-compliance some of the barriers to people being compliant with their meds I work with a lot of homeless I do a lot of homeless clinics as a nurse practitioner homelessness I would say I don't know what the statistics say but just from what I've seen I'd say 90% of homeless people have some type of site something going on that is a huge barrier to being able to get these meds, take these meds, remember how to take them, 
okay, getting their prescriptions filled. filled. So that's a, a big thing. They have transportation issues, they have lack of planning, they have lack of money, lack of insurance. They're not thinking right, okay? They don't have somebody to help them, okay? So that's a huge barrier. Um, they have poor insight. People that have poor insight don't change their behaviors, okay? Poor, your insight is your being able to see your part in this situation, okay? It's not their fault, it's out of their hands, that's how they think. So they're not gonna try to do anything. That interferes with them being compliant to their meds also. Being confused interferes with that. Faulty thinking, they think people are out to get them. The pharmacist put some poison in their medicine bottle so they're not gonna take it. That doctor is really out to get him because he wants my whatever, okay? They're not thinking right, that interferes with it. Also, after seeing all, some of these side effects, you see where a problem may be, people wanting to take their meds, okay? Um, also, some people don't wanna take them because of the stereotypical reaction they get from people, okay? Oh, they're crazy, they thought they're, they even call them their crazy meds, okay? That interferes with people being compliant. They don't want people to know their own psych meds, so they just don't take them, okay? Costs also, some of these new ones are extremely expensive, okay? They don't have insurance, they don't have a job, they don't even have a home, okay? That's all gonna interfere with it. As you start working with psych though this semester, you need to realize that um, non-compliance a lot of times isn't willful, okay? It's part of that condition that they have. All these other things lead up to the non-compliance. And with psych, you're gonna have um, readmission, readmission, readmission. You're gonna see symptoms get better, get worse, get better, get worse, okay? Sometimes it's not their fault. They're taking their med, especially like they're, perfectly like they're supposed to, it just stops working, okay? So we have to change meds. So it's not like some things like blood pressure, you give them a med, it fixes it, that's the end of it. This is something like you're trying to hit this moving object all the time, okay? So things are changing all the time. That makes sites a lot more harder to treat. But it's very